And I think the older I get, the more I'm going to transition to writing than a lot of the other things I'm doing because there's seasons in our lives. But you can't have the power, you can't have that might until you discover the purpose and that purpose begins to set boundaries for you. That's one, of, that's one of the powers that is wrapped up within counsel. It sets boundaries for you. God says, this is my purpose. This is the direction you need to go. Here's the anointing to, to begin releasing this in your life. And the word constantly tells us, don't turn to the right hand or to the left. You know why? It's called temptation. Now, how many of us have God at one time or another has released a prophetic word into our life or released a, a word of counsel into our lives and we didn't let it set the boundaries? And especially with the anointing of counsel, there's a time, there's an, there is an expiration date. Either you move in obedience or you lose your window. It's not like a prophetic word because that prophetic word when, when God spoke some words over Mary and I over 30 years ago, we look like the least likely candidates for what we're doing now. And in the process, we had belief, then we had disbelief. It's like, you know, how God could ever use us to do this? And there was stumbling, there was, because God knew in that prophetic word says, listen, as you walk with God, you may stumble, you may fall, you may pick yourself back up, you may get a little off course, but in this walking, you're throwing away aside every weight that so easily besets you. There's a transition from Abram to Abraham. And so when God says, I'll make you a father of many nations, Abram couldn't pull it off. It was after he walked with God enough that God matured him and got enough junk out of his life that he grew to the place that God says, you finally got to the place where I can start calling you Abraham because now you have become the person that I foresaw you to be in the future that you took by faith because you could not see how in the world you could have become that person. And so there's actually more leeway, there's more play with a prophetic word many times. But when, when, when a man or woman moves under the anointing of counsel, it, it, is, a, it is a kiros moment. It is that, that, that moment of opportunity that God's saying, now take the step. It's like stepping out in the water, the water's going to part. Or hold your rod up over the water, it will part. They didn't have to pray about it and fast about it. There was, there was an anointing there with releasing that for it to go forth. And see, that's where we really need to get with obedience and having the discernment when God begins to speak and this anointing of counsel begins to flow. That once we act on it, its twin begins going into operation in our lives. Now let's look at this word that is translated might in the Hebrew, giborah, which is a derivative of giborim, because first giborim represented the giants, but then both within, within the legends of all the pagan religions and with the concept within the Hebraic nation, they had supernatural strength to do great exploits. And so when you look at this, it means strength, might, Valor, bravery. You see, sometimes when that word of counsel is given to you, you may not be brave. But as you step out in obedience, the bravery comes. You may not be strong when the word is given to you, but when you step out in faith because you recognize that anointing, The strength comes. And there's a lot right now in the body of Christ. There has been a word given. And they're sitting there and they're twiddling their thumbs and they're waiting and waiting and waiting on the strength to come. And God is saying, go ahead and step out. And when you step out, the strength will come. But if you respect authority, the authority of God and the authority of those that are functioning and have, have walked a walk that, that brings honor to Christ, that have proven 
their eldership. When you step out, it releases power. That other side of that begins to go into effect. And when it does, you begin finding strength that you didn't have. You begin finding bravery you didn't have. You begin finding might that you didn't have. And you begin to see that you can do great exploits for God beyond anything that you ever thought possible when these two go into operation in your life. Well, there's another one about might that's so important. When you look at in the authorized version, it's translated might 27 times, strength 17 times, power 9 times, mighty acts 4 times, mighty 2 times, force once. But in one situation, it's translated mastery. That in your obedience, you finally gained mastery of self. Because self is the biggest thing you need to learn to take control over. And how many know sometimes it takes, it's going to take a supernatural purpose of God for it to work. Let me give you a couple of biblical examples. Israel had already seen that Moses would say certain plagues are coming, certain things are coming. And they would see the wrath of God poured out on Pharaoh. But all they basically had to do is duck and cover in Goshen. Just duck and cover. It won't come here. It's over there. But then they come to pass overnight. It's not just ducking and covering anymore. Moses said, get all packed up. We're leaving in the morning. Now we're going to do Passover. And after you sacrifice that Passover lamb, you're going to put the blood over the doorpost. And then you're going to hunker down under the blood. Oh, there's a sermon there. Learning to hunker down under the blood in obedience. He said, you may have been slaves for hundreds of years. And the taskmaster's toil upon your back has been harsh. You've been worked without a day of rest. Oh, can I, can I touch on that just a minute? Sabbath is for free men. You're going to get that here in a minute. The Sabbath are for those that have been freed in Messiah. That's his day. He's Lord over it. The devil will never let you rest. Pharaoh never let them rest until God interjected his kingdom. So keeping the Sabbath is something that a free man gets to do that's free of the taskmaster of this world because he has had that Passover. So here we have a people that have been abused, that have been broken down, that have been underfed, that, that, have, that have worked all this time. How many know that takes a toll? And he says, here's how you're going to do Passover. You know, part of the Passover is remembering where you came from, the bitter herbs and the horseradish and all these things to remind them of the harshness of Egypt. And then that they needed the sacrifice of the lamb. And I love the instruction of it. They got to eat it all. That's something the church needs to learn because there's a lot of part, there's parts about Jesus and the things that he said from Genesis to Revelation that a great portion of the body of Christ doesn't like. You're not going to be free until you eat it all. Boy, I'm, I'm so far off out of my nose, but this is good. You got to eat it all. And if there was any left because they had a big lamb and a small family had to be burned by fire, nothing left. 
They went to bed as the judgment of God, if you could sleep, knowing the next morning that they were going to have to leave. Their obedience to the counsel and this anointing of counsel that, that belongs to Messiah that was flowing through his Old Testament representative named Moses, when that flowed and they were obedient, the spirit of might took a hold of them. And the next morning as they walked out of Egypt, there was not a single feeble one among them. There were no crutches. There were no wheelchairs. There were no walkers. When the Bible says there was not a feeble one among them, they walked out with a new strength that they didn't possess the night before because they were obedient to the counsel which released the might. I don't know about you, but I'm having fun. Okay? The next is Gideon. You know, we have the Gideons running around. I remember one time years ago with the seminary, I had, there was a question, you know, who was Gideon? Well, he was an Old Testament guy that passed out Bibles. <laughs> well, you need to go back and actually read your Old Testament survey just a little bit deeper. <laughs> Gideon was fearful of the Philistines and the enemies of God. And so he was able to get, gather in this harvest of grapes. And as, and as he was treading them, at the same time he was getting low like this so that nobody could see him in the wine vat treading the grapes. And every once in a while he'd look out and say, Any Philistines around? Oh. He was a coward. He was a coward. Because he had not been given a word of counsel. This angel comes up, appears to him. And if you read the story, here he is crouching, looking around very timidly, looking for Philistines, and an angel shows up and says, Hail, mighty man of valor! Who? <laughs> Me? Of course, Gideon, you know, there are times Gideon wanted to make sure, you know, even though an angel showed up, he did the fleece, and there's, that's a whole other teaching. But what the angel spoke to him, that word of counsel, was beyond where he was in the flesh, but not where he was with God. And because he finally received that word that was given to him by that angel, he became a mighty man of valor. He did great exploits for God in impossible situations where he was outnumbered God gave him victory. You see, you need to understand in your life, there's a lot, we're always outnumbered if you just look at humans. We're always outnumbered. The situation is always against us as long as we're in this world because the way of the world is against anyone walking in the kingdom of God. And to tell you the truth, it destroys 80% of those that are in the world not even walking with God because it only brings forth death. But once we have stepped out of that, then everything within that kingdom is against you to press you down, to, to keep you in your wine vat with a little bit that you have, treading it down, with this worry that somebody might get it. But when God comes on the scene and a word of counsel that that purpose is released in your life, you come out of that vat and say, okay, who are we going to take on now? There's a difference in that anointing. And in the days ahead, we're going to need that spirit of might. We have got to have it. I read in Daniel... One of my favorite verses in the Bible. That Antichrist is at his zenith. And everybody's saying, who in the world can go to war against this guy? He's at the zenith of his power. 
But the Bible says there will be those that are passionate, that know their God, that are passionate about God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They'll not bow the knee to anything that comes against the, the, the kingdom of God and the truth of who Messiah is. And it says that they will do great exploits. The spirit of might takes a hold of them. And what's fascinating to me in the book of Daniel in the Aramaic and in the Hebrew, it gives a connotation, this thought, that because they're so passionate about God and they're walking so much with God that they can begin doing mighty exploits, supernatural functions at will because their will is so intertwined with God's. That's so important, guys. You cannot have your will intertwined with God's when you're doing your own thing. Your agenda will stop the kingdom. The agenda of your flesh, the agenda of your past, whatever the case may be, it will stop you from functioning in the things of God. It will stop might from functioning. It will stop that counsel, that anointing for counsel to function. But see, there's a release. When you know your purpose, everything else is razored off to the side. That's not me. I feel like there's a, a, an anointing of counsel right now. There's a lot of things that all of us define ourselves by that God did not speak, that God did not do, that others have put on you, that situations have put on you, that demonic presence in other people have put on you and convince you that that is you and it is not. It is slave clothes on you. Just because you're wearing tattered slaves' clothes does not mean you're a slave. It means you're mind controlled by the enemy. He has hid his purpose from you. I love the story of blind Bartimaeus. And people that read the story many times miss this. You know, he, he cried, Son of Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Everybody told him to shut up. He got louder and louder. Everybody likes that part. But they, they don't understand the cultural significance when he began to strip his clothes off. It wasn't that he was a streaker, okay? But people that were blind, now today, people that are blind, they'll have a cane. And that, that, that's kind of a social norm within America that that person has a sight handicap. There were special clothes that a blind man wore. And when he heard Jesus' voice, he began to rip off what other people had put on him, and he began to rip off that which said he was blind, and he said, I'm going after becoming a man who can see. There are too many right now that are functioning out of the lives of the enemy. Your purpose is not the purpose that you're all tied up with right now. That you are not defined by your past. You are not defined by what others have spoken over you. You are defined by what Father God says that you are in Christ. That supersedes everything else. That you may have came and come into this thing sitting at that Passover table feeble and broken and helpless. But once you receive the Lamb, as you begin to get up and walk away from that table in obedience to Him, you found out that a new man took hold, and that new man is not feeble, is not broken, is not whatever the labels people put on you, but is now completely caught up in Christ, and now there is a strength that you didn't have before. Oh, guys, you need to get this. God right now is wanting to pour out might on the body of Christ unprecedented in our generation. The problem that he is having is we won't listen to him regarding who we are and the purpose that we're supposed to walk in.
You can't get this without this. You have got to receive the counsel and purpose to begin functioning in the might. And I see, I, I see it's systemic. You know, even on our YouTube channel. You know, like the teachings that I do here, we'll have, you know, after about a month or two, you'll have one, two, three, four, five thousand people watch it. But I can do something about something obscure about end times or, or something about uh, Nephilim secret walls and, and uh, uh, you know, or, or something like that. And I'm amazed because those will be listened to 15,000, 30,000, 40,000 times where ones that can really change people's lives are listened to maybe two or 3,000 times because we're information junkies as long as the information doesn't deal with us. Now, I love teaching end-time prophecy. I, I can, I can I, in fact, I have. I've gone for days teaching on Genesis 6 and, and Genesis 11 and, and the book of Daniel and all these different things. And they're all powerful. They're all important. But if you don't catch who you are in Messiah, what He did for you, how to completely come under, under it, and this, and this entire working process of, of Him molding you into who you can be. And there will be words of counsel that are released all along the way that if you're not sensitive to the Spirit of God, you will miss them. Completely miss them. And then you wonder why, you know, God's, God never intended any of us. Guys, listen to this. If you're at the same place you were 10 years ago, you've missed counsel in your life. You've missed a step, you've sat down, you've done something. Because in the journey, you're transformed. In the journey of walking with God, and God will have you go up some hard roads. You know why? In those hard roads, you begin throwing all the rocks out of your pockets. Mary and I can tell you that from personal experience. Some of the hardest things, that, some of the things that we got rid of the most rocks is when we had the Philistines circling and they're firing at us and it was either drop the rocks or die. <laughs> at least it felt that way. And some times it was probably pretty doggone close to that. There wasn't a debate. It's this is what God's Word says. This is what God's purpose is. Anything not, get out of my life. I'll change anything I need to change. I'll, I'll, I'll get rid of anything. I'll accept whatever the Word says, whatever, whatever God wants in my life. I am going to do that. It's in the hard spots that that happens. And yet we want the anointing of counsel to come on us in light, airy, fluffy ways. When everything's peaceful and everything's calm and you're sitting there and there's an angel just dropping grapes into your mouth every once in a while so that you can kind of eat those and, and just feel refreshed and everything needs to be so harmony and peaceful like a little paradise. Do you know when the warrior is really forged? It's in the heat of battle and he listens to his commander and he learns the art of war. And in that process, the old greenhorn dies and a warrior emerges because he learned the purpose and power of understanding how to submit to authority and how to hear true words from his commander and how to begin functioning in these things the way that he needed to. And when he did, the soldier is always revealed. And if you don't think we're in a battle right now, we are. We've got to have the counsel. We've got to have the might. We've got to move on in the things of God like never before. This is one I want you to write down if you've not gotten it yet. Obedience to the anointing of counsel will release the anointing, the anointing of might into your life for that situation. For that situation. Now, if you learn from that situation, the might will remain. Because there was a transformation that took place as you moved through it. Guys, this is so necessary. 
And so I, I wish I could preach this harder today. I wish there was a way that I could drill this into all of us. Because only when you have purpose released and you accept it, does the might come. And when might comes, it's a supernatural thing. It's a supernatural thing. Let's close today in prayer. Father God, we come before you. Father, we ask that you would anoint our ears. Father, that we can be sensitive to hear when you are speaking authoritatively through someone. Father, let us be able, whether it's preaching, whether it's counsel, whether it's whatever, Father, even in written form. Father, let us be able to hear your voice in the voice of man so that we can recognize counsel when it begins to flow. And Father, right now we're asking for grace to hear and we're asking for grace to do, to be obedient, to let that purpose flow in our lives. And Father, the very act of hearing and responding to it, Father, builds an expectancy on the inside of us for your power to begin to flow. A purposeless people will not have power. People that are involved in their own things will not have power. But it's only kingdom in which your power is going to back up and flow. Now, Father, realign us. Give us new windows of opportunity for counsel to be released for the situations in our lives. And Father, in the process of this, we ask that the fire of God would be kindled afresh in our lives like never before. And Father, we just thank you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name.